Here's a pen. It's a fountain pen. There's no philosophy of fountain pens, as far as I know. Why is that? Fountain pens have been a long, around for a long time. Uh, many people use them. And if you don't use a fountain pen, you might use another kind of pen. So it's a significant part of human experience, the pen. And yet there's no philosophy of pens. Why is that? I think it's because a pen isn't puzzling. It works. We understand what this is, we understand what it does, and that's it. We haven't encountered any kind of conceptual confusion in our engagement with pens. And if you think about it, most things in our everyday life are like that. We sort of get what they do, and we get on with it. It's only really when you find puzzles about the everyday, about your own ordinary experience. If puzzles arise in ordinary experience, conceptual puzzles or cognitive puzzles or puzzles of thinking, then we start to ask philosophical questions. Because in a sense what we then do is first identify that something we thought we understood or something we thought we knew, we don't actually understand or we don't actually fully know. So there is more to be understood or more to be known. And these puzzles are not really about missing crucial data or lacking information, but it's about understanding better how we were already thinking about things. That's really what philosophy does. So if you want to understand a philosophical theory, you need to understand the question that the theory is trying to address. So if you, if you engage with a theory of knowledge, for example, you need to identify what questions are philosophers asking about knowledge. Someone might ask, is knowledge possible? Or someone might ask, what is knowledge? These questions are important, but you can even go one step further and identify the problem or the puzzle that gave rise to the question in the first place. So take knowledge as an example. You might think that knowledge is itself a phenomenon that we're all very familiar with. I know lots of people, I know lots of things, I know lots of facts about the world, and in a sense that's not puzzling at all. Why is it that we start asking philosophical questions about knowledge? There might not be a single answer to that question. One historically influential idea has been skepticism. So you might imagine yourself uh, being in all kinds of scenarios where you are systematically fooled about the state of the world. In, in, in the writings of Descartes, you get the example of an evil demon that is somehow tampering with your experience and making it such that everything your senses are presented with is just an illusion. It's not real. It merely seems to you that there is a world with other people, you go to university, etc. Is that scenario possible? And can you rule it out? Can you rule out that you're in that skeptical scenario where you're being deceived by an evil demon? Once you start thinking about your ordinary everyday knowledge in that way, you realize that you might not really understand what's going on. You might not really have a clear understanding of how it is that you count as knowing certain people or your environment, given that you're not actually able it seems, to exclude the possibility that you're being deceived. So the very conditions of knowledge suddenly give rise to a philosophical puzzle. Now for everyday life you don't really have to do anything with this because your ordinary conception of knowledge is good enough. But at least for the philosophically interested, so to say, the puzzle is now there. The question arises, how is knowledge even possible? And now we can start philosophizing developing philosophical answers to that question and have a theory of knowledge. Turn to pictures. What's the puzzle that generates the question, what is pictorial representation? I haven't really said anything about that. So I've told you about the question, but I haven't told you about the puzzle. Let's look at this. Here's a picture. 
So what's puzzling about a picture like this? Well, first of all, we should observe that it's just a piece of paper. A piece of paper with some kind of pigment on it. In this case, it's ink. It's been printed. The ink is spread out on the surface of the paper in certain patterns. And in some way or other, that realizes a representation, a representation of an owl. In a sense, this is ordinary, but once you start thinking about it, there are two big sources of puzzlement that might arise. The first has to do with how this can be a bearer of meaning, how this piece of paper can have significance to us in, in a communicative sense, can mean something, can be about something. And the second puzzle has to do with what actually you get to see when you look at this picture. What do we see here? The natural thing to say is we see an owl. Just as natural, I think, as saying we see a picture of an owl. But that's telling, given that there is no owl here. So we've got two ways of approaching pictures philosophically that, in a sense, lead to different projects of theorizing. The first is really a question about how is it that a piece of paper like this, with inks on it, can have meaning that is significant for us, can, can be a communicative artifact. And the other is more a question about our experience of the picture. So what is it that we actually get to see when we look at a picture? So let me say something brief about this first puzzle, the puzzle about meaning. Meaning is a very general phenomenon. We find it in the natural world. We find it very clearly in written and spoken language, and we find it in the pictorial tradition, the tradition of making images. Images are meaningful, but once you start studying images in contrast or comparison to language, you will see that the meaning is realized in a very different way. Language has a certain kind of structure, something we call a grammar, and it has a vocabulary doesn't seem to be present in the case of pictures. And yet they are meaningful. So here you just suddenly have a question. We know that pictures are meaningful. We know that we use them in communication, but they don't seem to fit this standard idea we have how meaning arises in linguistic communication. So what should we say about how meaning comes about in the case of pictorial representation? What is the distinctive way pictures represent? So that is one way of getting at this core question of um, the philosophy of pictures. But now look at it from a different perspective, a different puzzle, a puzzle about, broadly, perception. So pictures are visual representations. They are meant to be looked at. You cannot understand a picture if you don't look at the picture. Of course, you can hear from someone else what the picture represents, but if you want to see what the picture represents, you actually need to go up to it and look at it. And what do you do in that process of understanding a picture? Well, it is very much as the thing you would do if you'd, for instance, entered a room and were asked, what's in this room? You open the door, you look around and you just look at the objects that are in the room and you say, well, there is a bed, there is a dressing table, there is a rug on the floor and a lamp on the wall. If you're presented with a painting of an interior, you would do broadly the same things. You would look at the objects represented in the painting and report them. But there's something puzzling about that once you think about it. Because Although in the case of the room, the objects are actually there. In the case of the painting, all you're confronted with is paint on a canvas. There is no bed. 
There is no dressing table, there is no rug and there is no lamp. Yet we very naturally think of ourselves as looking at these items. Are we fooled? Is there some kind of big confusion or error that we have? Some people have said that. Some people have said that in the end, pictures are illusory devices. But that idea is, I think, quickly corrected once you actually reflect on our experience of the picture. We don't in any way feel inclined to take the items that we see on a painting to be present in the room with us. We're very well aware that we're dealing with representation. I mean, it's almost as clear as it is in the case of language. So when we read about a room with a bed and a rug and a dressing table, we also are in no way inclined to think that there is now a bed, a dressing table and a rug near us or in our vicinity. We understand full well that reading about these things puts us in some kind of contact with those things or with ideas of those things, but these things don't have to be present in order for that to happen. And similarly, that's exactly what we know is the case in pictures. It's only in exceptional circumstances that pictures fool the eye. So there are famous Tromblau pictures that are actually designed to fool the eye. And it's only then that we really can speak of a kind of illusion that we have. But that experience is very different from our ordinary engagement with pictures. So here there arises a question. Pictorial representation seems to be distinctively visual in that, in some sense, it shows what is represented. But what actually is going on when that happens? What is distinctive of that way of representing? What is distinctive of pictorial representation? So here we've seen another way of arriving at the core question of the philosophy of pictures. So we have two kinds of puzzle that underpin the philosophy of pictures. So when you ask, or when you hear other people ask the question in philosophy, what is distinctive of pictorial representation? Always keep in mind, which of these puzzles is actually driving these people? Which of the puzzlement are they trying to resolve? Are they really more interested in the question of how the meaning of pictures comes about in contrast to how meaning comes about in, say, language or in other phenomena? Or are they more interested in the experience we have of pictures and the role that experience plays in our understanding of pictures?